How do you grow a company or product quickly, systematically and efficiently using a method that has helped us reach the moon, discover the cure for polio and helped shape the modern world? How can you use it to build companies, the likes of Dropbox, Twitter, Airbnb, and how can you use it to optimize the growth rate of a product or service? The way to do so, according to at least its advocates, is through a process called growth hacking. Growth hacking in brief is a combination of four main things. These are data, the scientific method, creativity, and psychology. It's a process and mindset that has one goal and one goal only. That is driving growth for a product or service. And this singular focus is what sets it apart from similar fields like traditional marketing. Its objective is to find the cheapest and most effective way of growing a product or service, whether it be through sales, user growth, or any metric that you deem as necessary for success. And by the end of this video, we'll gain a thorough understanding of how it's used and how it's been used to grow some of the world's biggest companies today. Why should you care? Because, as its proponents say, it removes the guesswork aspect of building products, companies, or anything that you dream of offering on the wider marketplace quickly, simply, and cost-effectively. To understand why it exists, we need to go back and understand its origin. Back to when touchscreen phones began to bring the modern internet to our fingertips. The term growth hacking was coined by Sean Ellis back in 2010 in a now famous blog post titled, Find a Growth Hacker for Your Startup. He stated, once startups are ready to scale, the biggest challenge is often hiring someone capable of leading the growth charge. A marketeer with the right talents and approach can kick some serious ass once product market fit and an inefficient conversion and monetization process have been proven. Sean Ellis at the time had already helped build several successful businesses using the growth hacking process. These include the likes of Dropbox, Eventbrite, and more. After some time, he decided to pivot and focus on helping early stage businesses with growth. Whenever an assignment would end and he would need to find someone to replace his role, he faced the problem of not finding candidates that understood the importance of growth for a business. Most of the potential hires although coming from the leading marketing schools, lacked one crucial thing, that obsessive focus on growth. And this realization led him to see the need for a totally new role, a role that came to be known as a growth hacker. Growth hacking extends beyond traditional marketing to include multiple fields, and it revolves around putting up a question or hypothesis in the context of growth, and then conducting experiments to find answers to these questions using data and insights from conducting research. It's a method of handling the problem of establishing and growing a business that can be applied to a one-person business, as well as a giant Fortune 500 company, a company like Airbnb. Founded by Nathan Lejarzyk, Joe Gibai, and Brian Chesky, Airbnb is a peer-to-peer -peer rental booking service where people can rent out their properties. Being a disruptive new business model at the time, the keys to success were not readily apparent to the founders. In the early days, they faced a growth problem, where they both didn't have enough people booking and people listing properties. The three founders had to come up with a solution quickly. Costs were fast eating up their capital, and if the trend had continued, the company would have ended up bankrupt. As if things weren't hard enough, things got more bleak. To address these problems, the Airbnb team decided to look at the data first and to see if there were any insights that may assist them in solving the booking problem. What correlated and causal factors that when influenced would lead to users making more bookings? What they discovered was people reserved properties more frequently when they had professionally taken photos. Although in retrospect, the assumption was simple. The Airbnb team decided to put it to the test in New York by enlisting the help of some experienced photographers and began the experiment. Their hypothesis was proven right, and this simple idea increased their rental booking substantially. However, they still had the issue of not having enough listings, so the team continued to brainstorm and came up with another solution to the problem. 
At the time, one of the largest peer-to-peer -peer auction sites was a website called Craigslist, which is a website where anyone may put up anything for sale. This ranges from second-hand goods to room rentals. Craigslist, despite its simple and bare-bones design, had something going for it. It had a sizable user base, and additionally, and even more importantly, it had Airbnb's target audience, who were people who wanted to avoid the expense and hassle of booking hotel rooms. The team at Airbnb decided to capitalize on this by reverse engineering the Craigslist API and making it such that all new posts on the Airbnb site became automatically listed on Craigslist, which encouraged users to visit the Airbnb website where they were greeted with stunning photos of properties to rent. If I get someone who lists their home with Airbnb, let me see if I can automatically give them a, a button to automatically post that then on Craigslist with a link back to Airbnb. Furthermore, the Airbnb team then created a script which automatically alerted users who posted a room rental on Craigslist via email to also list their properties on the Airbnb website. This hack and the other skyrocketed Airbnb listings until Craigslist locked them out. However, by this point, Airbnb's growth had become sustainable with volumes of users being exposed to the platform and the firm went on to become the behemoth that it is today. Although the strategy may be considered very questionable, the lesson here is that your solution to progress may include taking unconventional approaches. It's not about following textbook principles or following well-defined routes. It's about pursuing your North Star, and that North Star is growth. So, what does growth hacking actually entail? What's the process? And how can you do it yourself? Growth hacking has three main principles that you need to follow to maximize your growth potential. These are using data to understand the people you want to reach, to understand your growth levers and to adopt a data-driven decision-making process. Two, rapid idea generation, experimentation and testing. And three, developing your growth mindset, your skills and bringing others on board. Mark Twain once said, data is like garbage. You better know what you're going to do with it before you collect it. This nugget of advice becomes even more relevant when you consider that each year we're generating more data than the sum of whole human history. That is a lot of information and it highlights why understanding it is so crucial. So to begin, first let's define what data is. Data is facts about something that can be used in calculating, reasoning or planning. And as you can guess, more data doesn't always mean more insights. In actuality, more data can cause something called analysis paralysis, which is an inability to make a decision due to overthinking a problem. An individual or group can have too much data. To know what to do with data then, you need to know what types exist, and data can usually be categorized into two main groups. These are qualitative and quantitative data, or rather categorical and numerical data. Qualitative research and data relates to the measuring by the quality of something, rather than its quantity. This means it's concerned with the characteristics and opinion of things, and how we categorize these attributes. It varies drastically, it's descriptive and it's highly subjective. You collect it by making observations through interviews, surveys, and focus groups. Examples of this would be your opinion on things, whether you like Apple products or Android whether a user likes the new app design or not. The goal of gathering qualitative data, especially early on, is to determine whether real people find your product valuable. In summary, you need to speak to people who will end up using your thing to truly understand how your company, product, or service is viewed. And this will help you determine what is known as product market fit. At the end of the day, you need to build something useful for somebody. So, one of the first tasks is to figure out who is that somebody, who are you really serving, and what is the job that they're hiring you to do. Product market fit occurs when you have successfully identified your target or ideal customer, and you produce a product or service that satisfies a customer need. Not achieving this is the reason many products fail, even if they have great offerings. 
If the customer cannot see the benefit, then they will not buy it. The second type of data to collect is known as quantitative data, and it's concerned with quantifying and measuring something. It's about the numbers, the numbers of active monthly users, your conversion rate, and so on. Therefore, the type of metrics you choose to focus on is determined by the type of business you're in. And roughly speaking, there are six major common business models, each of which require their own sets of metrics. The first is e-commerce businesses who sell products directly to their customer. Examples include Amazon, where transactions usually occur only once. Second are software as a service or SaaS companies who sell software via subscriptions. This is in the form of recurring payments and an example of this is Salesforce. The third business model is the freemium apps or services that earn through ads or micropayments. Examples include many of the top mobile gaming companies or even the free Spotify membership tier. Next are media driven sites which rely on advertising or subscriptions. Companies like Netflix and news companies do this. The fifth is user-generated content platforms, such as social networks, where the user or data is the main revenue stream. The likes of Instagram and Twitter do this. And finally, a two-sided marketplace like Craigslist and eBay. One thing to note, however, many companies can include a combination of these models and are not limited to only one. An example of this is Spotify, which is both a freemium service and a media-driven site that earns from a subscription tier. Once you've determined your business model, the next thing is not to jump to collecting, but rather to organize all these data points. Having a clear way to group them, knowing when to change focus can help you avoid analysis paralysis. Easiest way to do so is to use frameworks. And frameworks are a system of rules, ideas, or beliefs that are used to plan or make decisions on complex structures. There are various frameworks available with each having their own pros and cons. However, for simplicity, we shall focus on David McClure's Pirate Metrics, a popular framework used in digital marketing. Dave McClure's Pirate Metrics is a system that aids in the categorization of metrics and marketing activities that are centered around the idea of a funnel. It aids marketers to easily identify areas to focus on based on five stages. These are, Acquisition, Activation, Retention, Referrals, and Revenue. Acquisition is about how well you're getting people into your various channels, such as visiting your website or app. It's how a store gets you inside their doors to make a purchase, and an example activity includes, but not limited to, SEO, email marketing, and ads. Activation is centered around how well you're getting these users to perform a desired action once they arrive on your property. Do you want them to sign up for something, download an ebook, watch a video, or to buy something? Retention is about how you keep them coming back or using your product. Do you keep them engaged by providing great content? Do you have a loyalty program to thank your best customers? And are you building that solid relationship with your audience? Next is referrals which is about how well you get these users or others to promote your product or service to others using the network effect. It's about how well you're converting your existing customers to promoters of your products and business. And finally, revenue, which covers your monetization strategy. How you sell, whether it be one-time purchases, subscriptions, or through an ad revenue model, which require different metrics and strategies. After you've evaluated each stage, you'll be able to identify bottlenecks and select what to prioritize. Not enough new customers? Then you probably need to focus on acquisition. People are not sticking around? Then retention is your best bet. Frameworks are constantly evolving. And the thing to remember is, frameworks are there to help you organize things. You pick the one that best applies to your business or product. Once you've got a handle of the activities and subsequent metrics for each stage, you'll soon come to realize that there are a lot of data points. Even when organized, all these metrics do have interconnected relationships. So what should you do then? This is where the concept of the North Star metric in growth hacking comes into play. Also commonly known as the one metric that matters, your North Star metric is a single metric that determines whether you're succeeding or not in a moment of time. And it forces you to have a clear goal 
that can be easily communicated. It's based around value delivered to your users and can include submetrics which have influence over it. It's a big part of your growth equation and finding it, however, is not always straightforward. Most of the times, like Twitter, you have to sift through various metrics, find patterns and test out assumptions to figure it out. Twitter is a social network and early on, Twitter was growing massively. At least it appeared that way. The truth was, Twitter did have massive user growth. However, they had a retention problem. Although people were joining the platform in droves, soon after most did not remain using the site. This was clear to see by comparing signup data and monthly active users. To discover the reason why it was happening, the team at Twitter analyzed signup data and discovered that users who signed up but also followed between 5 to 30 other users immediately were more likely to remain active in the long term. This realization led Twitter to implement a user onboarding process that required users to follow a certain number of users immediately upon signing up to the service. The simple reason for this is that users want a consistent stream of content on the feed to keep them engaged, as well as highly relevant content to make the value prop of using Twitter significant. This onboarding process created a stickiness to Twitter, and the company went on to achieve its growth objectives. This begs the question though, you're not Twitter. The metrics you should monitor may be completely different. How can you pick the right metrics regardless of what business you're in? And how can you discover your own North Star? First, you need to be able to determine what makes a good metric. And you can do this with the following four guidelines. A good metric is understandable. It can be counted, discussed, shared, and easily communicated. If no one understands it, then the power to affect it becomes limited. A good metric is comparative. The ability to take a metric and compare it between user segments, time duration, and other business figures yields valuable insights on the state of your business operations. Twitter compared its user signups and retention metrics to understand that they had a problem. Building on comparisons, Good metrics are also often ratios or rates, which are inherently comparative. Conversion rate, for example, is the most well used highlighting how well a page, ad or campaign brings in new customers. And finally, the best metrics lead to behavior change. That is, what can you do when a certain metric changes? Not being able to answer that question means the metric is pointless. Now that we know what a good metric is, how do you start choosing? You do so by keeping the following categories in mind. First, vanity metrics versus actionable metrics, reporting metrics versus exploratory metrics, leading versus lagging metrics, and correlated versus causal metrics. Vanity metrics are numbers that look good, but not always lead to a change in behavior. They're often totals, but not always. So things like total page views and total traffic. These numbers cannot be actively affected and therefore are pointless to track. But the reason companies like to talk about vanity metrics is they both make your competitors feel bad about themselves and also reveal nothing about your business. A better alternative is focusing on actionable metrics, which are always tied to a task and lead you to alter your behavior based on your business objectives. Let's say you see a sudden drop in monthly active users. Here is an indication that something is off and spurs you to look for an answer. And the reason why these distinctions matter is that entrepreneurs need to focus on just the few key actionable metrics that matter to their business. Don't. So like the engine of growth that's available to you is really different depending on the kind of business that you're in. Reporting metrics provide an overview of the day to day operational figures and can assist you in understanding how things are going. They're usually used to report to management. They should not be used in decision making, although they can also include actionable metrics. Exploratory metrics, on the other hand, are speculative and require extensive research. If actionable metrics highlight an issue, exploratory metrics provide the solution. They require you to dig deep into your data to understand all the different influences that each data point has on another. This is where Airbnb and Twitter found their North Star. So exploratory is the kind of stuff when you're looking into your data and you've probably, because collecting data is pretty easy, you probably have a bunch of data about your business, looking into it to look for insights and new learnings about what's going on with your system. Leading metrics try to forecast the future. So for example, by predicting the number of users in your funnel or sales pipeline, 
In contrast, lagging metrics tell you what went wrong in the past. Examples include bounce rate O and NPS score, which can be used for long-term improvement. But immediate change is often hard to achieve. A lagging metric is something that you know, basically reports the news. A leading metric or a leading indicator is something that tells us um, something else is going to happen down the road. So it's kind of predicting the future, or at least has the potential to predict the future. Correlated metrics highlight a relationship between two or more metrics. However, correlation is just an indicator of a relationship, not a determination of one. Meaning, changing one doesn't always change the other. An example would be sales decreasing during the summer months. This is a seasonality correlation. To make it more actionable, however, you need to determine the causal factor of the decrease. This is where causal metrics come into play, where instead of just highlighting a relationship, you can actively influence them to lead to a desired result. Understanding metrics will lead you to better decision making, and in turn, better results. It's about understanding the importance of discovering your North Star, which is about value. Value delivered for your users, customers, and audience. Twitter learned early on that just measuring signups wasn't enough. Companies can have massive user growth but still be in trouble if problems like retention are not addressed due to focusing on the wrong thing. It's about learning what your metrics are and how to pick them. It's about knowing how to measure, when to measure, and why you're measuring things. It's about understanding the benefits of frameworks, prioritizing the things that need the fewest resources yet yield the greatest results when leveraging the insights gathered from rigorous investigation. It's the difference between being data informed versus being data driven. The second principle of growth hacking is the most popular and creative aspect of the field. It's the idea of rapid idea generation and experimentation. This principle is based on the scientific method, which is an empirical method of acquiring knowledge and a process of objectively establishing facts. How we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. We compute the consequences of the guess. We see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature and to experiment or experience. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. The three people credited with popularizing the scientific method are Galileo and an astronomer and physicist, Francis Bacon, a philosopher, and René Descartes, a mathematician and scientist. It has evolved over the years and finally rested on the following seven main steps. First, you ask a question about what you need answered. Next, you research the topic and make observations. You formulate an explanatory hypothesis, also simply called an assumption. Then you design and create an experiment to test that assumption, where the experiment is repeatable with similar results. You run the test and analyze your results. After you analyze, you interpret the data and decide whether you accept the hypothesis or not. If the hypothesis is correct, you make your conclusion. If it's not, you formulate a new question. For growth hacking, however, the process has been adapted and streamlined to only four important steps. First, you analyze and use what you know from principle one to understand the data you collected. That is, who are your users and their behaviors? What is the problem you're trying to solve and what metrics you need to focus on to determine your growth equation? Next, you ideate, where you need to generate new ideas based around solving a problem and achieving an objective. That objective should be based on moving a particular metric forward that adds to your North Star metric. Therefore, it's brainstorming towards a goal. When you have enough ideas, you go to prioritization. That is, you pick what has the lowest effort with the maximum impact, also known as the I scoring method. You vote with your team or yourself, and then you refine the top candidates. Once you have all your top ideas, you can then begin with testing. And testing can be accomplished in a number of ways. You probably have noticed it in your favorite apps and websites. Things get shuffled around here and there. Images for the same content seem to change once in a while. Page layouts, titles, and even features pop up one day to soon disappear. There is a method to the madness, 
and that madness is actually rather logical. What you're observing and experiencing is the scientific method in action achieved using rapid experimentation. And when it comes to experimentation, as mentioned, can be a range of different tactics and changes. When it comes to testing then, there are two avenues you can take dependent on the idea that you want to test. These are discovery testing and split testing. Discovery testing is the simplest way to begin your experimentation journey. And the best analogy is to think about the two player board game battleships. In the game, each player is a grid only viewable by them where they can place their ships. Each player then takes turns by guessing the other player's ship locations on the grid and a correct guess is considered a hit. The aim of the game is to guess all the correct locations through trial and error until you've taken out your opponent's fleet, which is considered a win. This process is analogous to discovery testing, where you have an assumption based on the data that you have collected. Then you build up the test, you implement, measure and analyze the results based on your original business objective. It's about trying out new things that you haven't attempted before, but the data is hinting that there could be an avenue for growth. An example of this is something we already mentioned, where the team at Airbnb discovered the effect of better photography on their site. However, ideas can be anything from trying out new marketing channels to things far more complex. The goal is if you think it will push your North Star metric up, then it should be attempted and tested. Split testing, also known as AB testing, is a powerful statistical experimentation method which allows you to compare two things to see which one has the desired results. It's not a new process and its modern principles can be traced back to Ronald Fisher in the 1920s who defined the process with his agricultural experiments. However, for the digital world, it works in the following way. First, you decide on a variable that you want to test. This variable can be anything from a headline, a button, images, or even layout for an app or web page. You then split user traffic where group A sees the original web page while group B sees the altered version. One thing to note, however, as highlighted is you need a certain amount of users or sample size to make A-B testing helpful. So if you have a small pool, the best approach would be to do a multivariate test, which means making more than one change at a time. So instead of focusing on just headers, you may need to make a few changes to test versus the original page. And furthermore, split testing only works when it's done systematically, accurately, and consistently. Therefore, plan with an objective, learn a little about the statistics behind it, and begin with a narrow scope, that is, two to three experiments at a time with a way to track accurately each experiment, what you learned, what didn't work, and what could be done differently. The final and most important principle of growth hacking is about psychology, not only as an individual, but also across an organization. It covers three main areas, which are mindset, the elimination of information silos, and working as a team and building teams. Your first step into growth hacking or anything really starts in your head and it involves what we call as mindset. And mindset in basic is a set of attitudes or beliefs that we hold which define how we think. According to Stanford psychologist and author Carol Dweck, in a modern classic, mindset generally falls into two camps, a fixed mindset and a growth one. These two groups approach and view the world very differently. People with fixed mindsets in essence believe the world is the way it is and we have very limited ability to change who we are and the traits are predetermined. This is in great contrast to the second camp, which is people with a growth mindset who believe that anything is possible with the right approach, consistent learning and that the world is filled with abundance. These themes and terms developed independently of each other, but when it comes to growth hacking, as you can guess, you have to approach it with a growth mindset and believe that any challenge can be overcome with a little grit and tenacity. To do so then, you need to embody the following three things, data-driven decision-making, becoming a consistent learner, and understanding the importance of speed. Whether it be in meetings or working on big projects, progress only occurs when you make a decision. 
Therefore, all the decisions you make need to be backed up with relevant data. Because firstly, it reduces wasted time and will result to better outcomes when we remove opinions and the gut feeling approach. Think back to Galileo, who had to overcome the challenges of his time when trying to prove that the earth circles the sun and not vice versa. You're human and humans are valuable. Making mistakes is part of the territory, but making decisions based on data allows you to make less of them. Furthermore, your product and circumstances are unique. How you work, the skills available in your team, the resources you have, and many more other variables only apply to you. So what others have done will most likely not work for you, and you need to approach things based on the data that you have on hand. Next, you need to become a consistent learner. This is especially true in the beginning when you're alone, but even if you work in a larger team, it will require you doing things that you haven't done before. Wearing the hat of a marketeer, a designer, an analyst, a storyteller, and more. These days, there are various tools available to help you accomplish these things without a technical background, from no-code tools to open source offerings. The idea is to learn when you can, use a tool when you cannot, learn from your mistakes, and to keep on improving. A great first step is to look at becoming a T-shaped marketeer, which can be a great starting point in your growth journey. Finally, growth hacking is about speed. When you're better, faster, and cheaper than the competition, you will succeed in most business ventures. The more you try things and learn faster than the competition means the probability of succeeding increases. Therefore, generate ideas rapidly, ask others for their input, record these ideas, and prioritize things accurately. What are silos? Silos are a system, process, department, etc that operates in isolation from others. Growth hacking needs data. This means you and your team need to have an understanding about the challenges and bottlenecks that occur at the different stages of the product lifecycle and customer experience. Most companies unfortunately operate with silos, where information is compartmentalized. This, unfortunately, will limit what you can achieve because firstly, you will face gaps in what you know, and even more importantly, you will limit the insights that other departments may have and in turn, their skill sets. Therefore, you need to start fostering closer collaboration with other departments and build those relationships where data can begin to flow and this means you need to work on building a growth team. The final part is both the biggest hurdle but yields the biggest results. That is building growth teams and working as a team. Nothing big is done in isolation and therefore, in order to foster growth hacking within an organization, you need not to only have a wide selection of skills, but also ideas and data. This means when you first start, everything needs to be unofficial. But as results improve, having a formal growth team will help you achieve things a lot faster. And to build a growth team, you need the following things. First, you need to get support from the top. It's that simple. You need someone at a senior level who understands the needs and benefits of adopting a growth hacking approach. If they do not understand why you're doing it, then you cannot feasibly convince others. Furthermore, support from the top will hinder any possible interference that you may face since most organizations are resistant to change. Secondly, you need access to data. Your ability to succeed is determined by your ability to access relevant information. This needs to be communicated as much as possible. And once you have access, you need to compile this data to a data lake. Next is you need to build a growth team with a range of perspectives and skill sets. You need a diverse range of skill sets to accomplish growth hacking at scale. At first, it will consist of internal individuals where you are leveraging the skill sets and ideas already within the organization. Support from a technical aspect such as a developer, a marketing team member, sales, and any product-related individuals. Once you can demonstrate success, then hiring can become a priority. After building a formal or informal team, you have to create a streamlined and democratic testing process. You need to foster rapid idea generation as mentioned earlier, and therefore, you need to be able to track these things efficiently. The idea, its topic, its motivation, how to test it, and a voting mechanism based on the ICE scoring method. This will allow everyone to vote and also prioritize your experiments 
when high tempo testing begins to happen more often. Next, you need to limit access to the team from outsiders. Anything new and anything different will face challenges. This will happen to most new growth initiatives, and you may need to limit access early on to ensure your team plans don't get derailed. Next, you need a reporting and rewards process. You must track and analyze all your experiments. This is critical for time management, but also to inform management about success and misses. Having a reporting framework will aid in communicating the return of investment of your growth initiatives and can help the wider organization understand its benefit. And finally, you need an agile and startup mentality. Being a growth hacker means you'll work in the beginning with very little resources. And this is both a blessing and a curse. So growth hacking is really about agility. As new channels come on and old channels die, you need a team that is a lot more agile to be able to get into those channels, work them while they're available, and really find new opportunities across the business for driving growth. To be successful, you need to embody the agile mentality and to be highly organized to achieve the little success that you can. And of course, this all may not be possible if you're the sole growth hacker. You do not have a team or you're just starting out. What should you do then? If the field excites you, then the way to become better is to learn how to learn and learn to love learning. If you found this video helpful, please like, share, and subscribe.